Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz saxophonist John Irabagon on the 2021 CD Bird and Streams and his new film, Legacy. Bird with Streams is a solo tenor saxophone outing celebrating Charlie Parker's centennial birthday, recorded in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And in October of 2021, there is a new film about John called Legacy. Both of these projects were fueled by the events of COVID, but he speaks truth and hope for the future. Enjoy. Joe, how are you today, man? Hey, I'm good, man. Hey, it's great to catch up with you. Yeah, thanks for taking time to talk. Yeah, man. So... I guess the first thing I want to do is th- just to dive in the idea that, you know, first and foremost, we're from Kansas City, so we have been in the midst of the 101st uh, birthday celebration of Bird and this latest of course, album, of course, yeah. Bird with Streams. So, and it was done during a pandemic. I mean, there's so many clashings and so many layers to this. <laughs> so let's just start at the alpha of this. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, going to South Dakota kind of getting into nature and and the construction of this album. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, March 2020, we're in New York, and New York gets crippled and basically shuts down from COVID getting on American shores. My wife's parents live in western South Dakota, and the morning that everything really started shutting down in New York, we just looked at each other. We're like, when's the first flight over there? And we looked, we we bought tickets at 7.30 in the morning, and by 10.30, we were at Newark and heading out to South Dakota. We thought we were heading out to South Dakota for two weeks just to, like, tide things over, right, like, just wait it out. Two weeks became a month, and then that month became nine months for me. We stayed in South Dakota for nine months, and we were originally going to stay out there for two weeks. I mean, it was great to, you know, I've got a, I had a two-year-old at the time, so she's a little bit older now, but it was great to have some help with the grandparents, great for her to grow up and have space to run around in like a park and, and pretty easy socially distanced stuff because uh, South Dakota is way less densely populated than New York, let's put it that way. Shortly after we mo- we went out there, I was like, you know what, I got to try to find a place to practice where I'm not like disturbing everybody because everyone will start wor- working from home and, and Zoom calling and all that. So I found a canyon about an eight minute drive away from their house. And I just I stumbled upon it, and I was like, wait a sec, this is kind of cool. No one's here. There's tons of hiking available. The canyon, the different, like, layers of the canyon make it that when I, if I stand at different parts, the reverb that comes back or bounces off the other way is different every every spot. So I wound up practicing at this canyon six days a week for six or seven months, probably seven months. And I was just catching up on some standards I had known and forgotten. I learned a bunch of new standards. I was working on some sound things. I was working on some time and tempo things. I was working on some extended technique things. I was composing. I was meditating. Uh, I was improvising a ton. And some of the material, the heads and melodies I was using to try to get some sound stuff happening and bouncing it off the different canyon walls and stuff, where I was trying to learn a whole bunch of and relearn a whole bunch of Thelonious Monk tunes and a whole bunch of Bird tunes, Charlie Parker tunes. It was just a joy and a pleasure to to re-jump back into those, try them in different keys, try them in different octaves, you know, just messing around with it, like totally a spirit of just play and and fun and experimentation. Because this was, for me, this was bonus time. While the world had gone crazy, I was able to find the solitude in this beautiful slice of nature in the middle of America. You know, I I pride myself in traveling the world with a lot of different bands and getting to see a lot of different places around the world and and really love doing that as part of the tour experience. And there are just certain parts of America I've never really spent any time in. So it was fascinating to really not be that far away from home, but have this little slice of heaven that I could, like, use as, as a second or third home base and really experiment and have no constraints on what am I going to do, what kind of projects am I going to make, none of that. It was more about just having fun and, and messing around with stuff. And then as the weather started getting colder after six, seven months, and we were deciding to, to leave South Dakota, I was like, you know, I spent so much time out here, and it's been such an important part of my growth and development as a musician and as a person. I was like, let me document this. Let me just bring out a, a portable rig, you know, nothing hi-fi, just people have one mic, stereo pair of mics to capture the, the reverb 
and go to a couple different places in this canyon and just record some things. And when I was gearing up to do that, I was like, you know what? I don't really ever, in my whole discography, I don't really have a record of standards. I don't have a record that's dedicated to the tunes of one of them, any of the important composers or whatever, even though they're a major influence on me. I just haven't done that for my own record. I just never really felt it was time, and I never thought it was right. But for this being Bird Centennial, me messing around with, with dozens of Charlie Parker tunes out in the canyon for a lot of different uh, improvement-based ideas, I was like, you know what? This would be a complete, it would be a challenge for me to try to keep myself interested through a whole recital's worth of, of Bird tunes, try to say something different with each tune, have each tune inhabit a different world. So I took it on myself to, to take on this challenge, and the source material is incredible, so you can't really go wrong. But it was a matter of me trying to find my own voice or my own movements or my own philosophies within Bird's masterpieces. And the whole, the whole entirety of this would have never happened if it hadn't been the pandemic. And we talk about how much and how hard this has been on everyone. It has. I mean, it's like life has been totally upended. You look back on this, is something that would have never happened otherwise and maybe forging some memories that I don't know that you took advantage of this time where the earth stood still. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm forever changed as a person as everyone is from this pandemic. I'm just glad that there was something after the initial couple of days or weeks of just being completely freaked out and everyone not knowing what was going on with this thing. At some point, there was a there was a light that switched on, and I was like, okay, how can we make the best of this situation? How can we try to grow as a person and grow as a musician? And exp you know, and when I found the canyon, I was like, okay, how can I experience this to the fullest? So hiking to different parts of it each day, meditating, you know, taking playing tons of long tones, trying to interact with birds, and there were some deer out there. You know, these are things I never would have you know, even conceived of, let alone even had a chance to try in New York. And so I was just glad to have all this bonus time every day for several months. Try to go with the flow every day. And if, if certain days had me playing into Rapid Creek, you know, and with, with no, like, you know, tangible outcome, at least trying to enjoy those, those times with, with nature and definitely pushing myself by making this record and, you know, I, I, I'm forever changed since then. Even if I've left South Dakota now, I'm always constantly on the lookout for a place outside that might be, that might have enough solitude that I could practice out there for some, some steady amount of time. So I never would have thought about that pre-COVID. You know, it's rare that I get to talk to somebody that actually in a capacity of interviewing interviewed Sonny Rollins, and there's a reference to that <laughs> that you did, which yeah. just like, that was early on for me. So when that happened, I was like, oh, man, like it was, <laughs> it was a big deal, you know. But there's so many things from that interview that I remember. And, when, and there's reference points in here about what you referenced and what reverberated in you. But I got to wonder, you know, Sonny went to the Brooklyn Bridge and he just was on his own. Did you ever think about the fact that he just kind of decided that he was going to follow nature and just kind of get away and go and do whatever, you know, just figure some things out? You know, I, um, <laughs> I I made this record. I, I was practicing out there for those months. I made this record, mixed. I edited it myself, and I and I started the mixing process. And I started to send it around to some friends of mine, some musicians and non musicians. And almost every single one of them was like, "Oh, well, this is your bridge. This is your version of the bridge." And I was like, I hadn't thought of it for one second until people started like relating it back to me, and. Now that I now that someone's brought it up, I can't stop thinking about it. And to be able to have taken it wasn't a chosen sabbatical, that's for sure, and on my part. But you know, just to have, have been able to take time out of a professional career and you know try to avoid any sort of careerist or opportunistic things for advancement or polls or any of that career stuff. Um, just to be able to take a couple months and just play for this sheer pleasure of playing and trying to get better and trying to get closer to what my, my voice is like. I wouldn't trade that for the world. And uh, Sonny, I mean, he's always been an inspiration for me ever since I've been a professional musician. But that, that it, when people started bringing up the, the Bridge Canyon connection there, I, I 
went back to my transcript of my interview that I did with him. I'm like, man, I, I, I've been subconsciously influenced by the, his words from that interview in like, I think it was 2016 or 2015. Uh, I've been subconsciously, inter, you know, just changed by his words. And I found some quotes that are in the liner notes because I'm like, man, this is exactly what I was doing out in the canyon, trying to experiment, trying to push, push the thing forward. And uh, I didn't even realize it at the time. <laughs> I, I get it. I, I do that kind of thing all the time where it's like, it just ruminates somewhere in your subconscious and it, kind of it makes its way out. Um, so you have a film coming out in October called Legacy. Talk to me a little bit about what it feels like to take yourself to that, out of that audio place and go into a film and what the film means to you. Yeah, so this is, this is super interesting and pretty unique at this point. I was touring with Ralph Alessi's group, This Against That, uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago. And Ralph and Andy, the piano player, Andy, Andy Milne, they knew some people in Columbus that were starting up a nonprofit to help jazz musicians. And, and the nonprofit called A Tribe for Jazz, their whole goal is to find jazz musicians with their own thing going on, with their own story, with their own, you know, music to, to, to bring to the world, and that they feel haven't been represented fully or could use some more recognition, you know, wider, wider recognition. And so they approached me to kind of be the guinea pig for, for these new ideas that this new group of people that Tribe for Jazz has, has uh, brought together. So they've got a cinematographer, they've got story writers, they've got, you know, Emmy-winning journalists, they've got stylists, they've got the whole, they've got social media people. All these things that we know as, as artists in the 21st century, like, we know we're supposed to be responsible for all that ourselves. <laughs> we know that like social media and, and the website thing, everyone, it's just become like, okay, now the artist has to do this, 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 and this, and this. And there's certain musicians like myself, particularly that I, that I know of, like, that's all well and good, but I'm not going to, I don't want to, I can't sacrifice my music or the time that I get to dedicate towards my craft for some of these other, you know, more career driven things. So I was never really going to go down a route like that because I just knew like, you know, I would rather spend, I have to spend my time working on my art. And it's unfortunate that, you know, all these other things are in the hands of musicians these days, but I'm just going to deal, I'm just going to deal with it because that's the choice I made. But I was approached by Tribe for Jazz with, with this intention to like, go, they have these specialists that know all about these different avenues of things. And I was like, sold. I, have never really focused on this kind of thing. I wouldn't know where to begin, so go for it. And so I spent three, four days with them in Ohio. We got some film, we got some photos, we got some sound stuff. I did a solo tenor concert of some of my original music, and they put this film together, and I could not be more happy with the results. It's, it's as a musician who has spent all my time devoted to just the music aspect and not really caring about this other aspect of the, the business end of it. It's beyond my wildest dreams what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, all the emotions that they added through colors and, and textures and, and camera angles and all that to, to, my, to several of my compositions. I couldn't have thought of it myself, wouldn't have been able to execute it myself, even though I had. And I'm just super thankful for, for the help. And... Um, it's definitely making me think about my music in a different light and make me try to delve even deeper into where I'm coming from as an artist. As we move forward here, obviously, if we would have talked a month ago, we probably would have had a different conversation about being on the other end of this, but it looks like there's things that are brewing. But I still think that there's things that are getting better as far as this pandemic is concerned. So as a professional musician, it's been away from live music for so long. Talk to me a little bit about what's been going on lately and what you are hoping the future brings with these projects and these opportunities. Yeah. I mean, I hope first, first of all, I hope that people like more, I hope that tribe for jazz does, does really well with this movie and that we get some really great response and that people really, the movie really resonates with some people because I want tribe for jazz to grow and bring in more artists and bring in, you know, 
different musicians from different countries and, and like have a whole stable of musicians that they've that they've handpicked to to help and and bring well, the world needs a lot now is, is some cre- creativity and some some love and some positivity and some you know innovation in a way that is just it just brings some interest and life back to creative arts and, and music in particular so i'm hoping try for jazz grows i'm hoping their footprint becomes a global one and i'm hoping that every musician that they decide to 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 help out has has a larger audience because i think it's just going to help every musician trying to make a living as a full-time musician in this world like with this kind of support system with people that know what they're trying to do from that as far as me i'm super happy with the solo tenor record uh i found another place out in south dakota that I'm going to try to record a solo Soprillo saxophone album at some point soon. Soprillo saxophone is the, the world's smallest saxophone. It's an octave above a soprano. So it's really shrill and evil sounding, and that's why I love it. And I'm trying to do a solo record on that thing. But also, while I was in the canyon, I was composing a lot. And I have two records that have been, that we squeezed some recording time in uh, when it was safe to do so with everybody, like right when, when everyone was fully vaccinated after those two weeks, we, we jumped in the studio. And so I have a quintet record under my, my long-standing group outright. This, this quintet record features Ray Anderson on trombone, one of my musical heroes for forever. So, I'm so glad I got a chance to play with him. Mm-hmm. Matt Mitchell on piano, Chris Lightcap on bass, and Dan Weiss on drums. And Ben Monders, a special guest on guitar on a track. And we have, a track with 65 extra musicians who who flew in some uh, some free improvisations over the course of the pandemic. So that record's done. It's called Recharge the Blade. It'll be coming out next year at some point. And then and all those tunes I, I wrote during the pandemic out, out in the canyon. There's another set of tunes for quartet, which features Matt and Chris and Dan, same rhythm section. Uh, Chris on electric bass this time. And this this quartet record is inspired by some of the early fusion groups, Weather Report and Mahavishnu and the 70s Miles thing. But it's filtered through my, my lens, of course, and, and there's a lot of free improv stuff and some groove things, and these guys sound amazing on it. And Adam O'Farrell jumps in on a couple tracks on trumpet, and Miles My, Akazaki jumps in, jumps in on a couple tracks on guitar. That record's called Rising Sun. I feel like I'm going to release them simultaneously because my... My record label has a history of me releasing two albums at the same time. So I might do that next year in the spring. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but, I, man, I couldn't be happier with those records. I think that the whole point is, man, I would have gone crazy if I, during this pandemic, and I would have gone crazy if I didn't try to stay creative or at least keep the antennae up to be receptive to song ideas or song forms or some sort of, you know, connection to the, the creative world. A lot of times for, for us getting to travel and, and play tours and, you know, play clubs and things like that, that takes care of that need a lot of time. But this past year and a half, it's, 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 it's been tough, but I'm really glad that I forged ahead to try to stay creative and, and stay on it because uh, now that, Hopefully the pandemic is starting to subside a little bit and hopefully it stays that way. Hopefully, I mean, I'm super happy with the body of work that, that came out of this terrible time. Right on, John. Hey, thank you for opening up about these projects. I really appreciate it. Good luck with everything as we move forward. It's great to catch back up with you. Thanks, Joe. It was great to hear you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in South Dakota, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to John for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. <laughs> Neon Jazz.